I'm Zibby Owens, and you're listening to the Webby-nominated podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. This episode has been sponsored by Lauren Gabrielson, which is a women's wear brand that creates elevated essentials for the modern women's wardrobe. The collection is entirely designed and produced in Brooklyn, New York. The Lauren Gabrielson woman values quality, versatile pieces that she can wear every day that are customized to her body, her time, and her style. And by the way, I have two Lauren Gabrielson headbands, which I wear all the time, and you can see in my photos on my events page because I wear them everywhere, and they're amazing, and actually my six-year-old daughter steals mine all the time. So anyway, laurengabrielson.com. I'm very excited to be with Matt Hall today. Matt is the author of Odds On, The Making of an Evidence-Based Investor. He is the co-founder and president of Hill Investment Group and currently lives in St. Louis, Missouri with his wife and daughter. He is also the host of the podcast, Take the Long View. So welcome to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thanks so much for coming on the show. I'm glad to be on this great show, Zibby. So Matt, you wrote this book called Odds On, The Making of an Evidence-Based Investor. And you know we met on vacation with our kids and you were like, well, I wrote a book and I had no idea it was so amazing. I read this whole book start to finish. It's called The Making of an Evidence-Based Investor in the subtitle, which sounds like very businessy, but this is really a personal story, this book that you wrote. And I just loved it. So I'm really excited to be talking to you about it. Oh, thank you. Well, I worked really hard uh, on the book and, you know, writing what for me is a very personal story, writing a memoir is not easy. And it's also at times, I heard one of your other podcast guests at one point say that it doesn't feel lonely if you're uh, creating a work of fiction because you're sort you're sort of getting to know this like village of people that you're creating. For me, going back through my own experience, you have these moments where you go, is this going to be relevant? Is this going to connect with people? And I loved the process. So, and writing the book has been transformational. And I really wanted to do a personal narrative that was aimed at sharing the truths or the the important truths I have found about modern investing. But I had experience watching my mentor write many books that didn't really connect. And uh, if you go to any any big bookstore and you look in the business section, it's littered with books that are all sort of doing the same thing. And I really wanted to do something different. So your book talks a lot about your personal journey and how you started off life. You dropped out of law school. You never thought you'd drop out of anything. You were almost ashamed of that decision, trying to find out what to do next. And you got lots of advice from your dad, which I realized you scattered sort of throughout the book. He originally pointed you in the right direction by saying, I know you're passionate about two things. You love financial markets and investments, and you're really into golf. We know that you're not going to win the British Open. So what about finding a job in finance? Which is like so classic. I love parents who just tell it like it is. And he says, surround yourself with smart people and learn something valuable. And he gave a lot more advice. So tell me about how your relationship with your dad has sort of affected your trajectory in work. And do you find yourself now giving advice to your daughter similar to this type of advice? Mm, yeah, I love your question. So first I would say both my mom and dad have been hugely important. They're both educators and, you know, our dinnertime conversations were not about business. They were generally about students and school experiences they were having. And I'm more like my mom. She's sort of tough, but fair, very outgoing, innovative, and we're very similar but we both admire and love my dad. He's patient and understanding and unconditionally supportive. And I would say in my parenting of our own daughter, I try to be some fraction of the magic mixture of the two of them. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I feel very lucky. But my dad's advice and his wisdom has had a huge impact on me. But as I think about like the most important things he said to me or the best advice or guidance I have felt from him, it's been less about the words and more about he has this look he gives me and has always given me that is, a again, a combination of I have high expectations of you and you can do it. And I can vividly remember like as a kid playing catch with him in the yard and we would always try to end our session on a good one, one that he would throw a little bit farther. And he always had that same look even then, like 
I'm going to make this difficult and you can handle it. And I have remarkably positive (laughs) self-talk, I think because both of my parents were always telling me, we expect a lot, but you can handle it. And even when I couldn't, their mantra sort of didn't change. It always felt that way. So that my relationship with them and the guidance they've given me has always, I think, been about somehow building my self-confidence and I'm hugely grateful. But that the advice of like, hey, you know, you need to rethink your plan for yourself. I just interviewed Danny Meyer, the Shake Shack creator and restaurateur who has a St. Louis background for my own podcast, Take the Long View. And he was about to become a lawyer himself. And his uncle said to him, you're going to be dead forever and you're going to be alive for about a hot minute. You don't need to waste your time becoming a lawyer. You love (laughs) food. So go work in food. There's such a finite amount of time we have. So don't waste it away in law. You're not passionate about it. You're miserable even thinking about taking your LSAT. So I think I had the same kind of moment or the same kind of experience with my dad, maybe a little less, you know, sort of tough than that. But yeah, I'm hugely grateful that I made that change. Wow. I bet you have a lot of clients who would say they're particularly grateful for that change as well. (laughs) Oh, you know, thank you. I would say, you know, it's such an interesting, the parenting piece of this is I think about my own daughter who you've met. We take walks together and I find myself doing the exact same thing that I just told you I found in my parents. It's like, if all you have, I heard on some show one time, a rabbi said, there are two hands of love, there's affection and discipline. If you have too much of one and not enough of another, you'll have sort of an imbalance. And I'm definitely more on the discipline side and my wife Lisa is much more on the affectionate side. But I find myself doing exactly what I just told you my parents did for me, which is always saying to Harper, I expect a lot, but I think you've got it. And I just, I I love that. I love that that gift was there. And actually, that's probably part of the reason I was able to do this book is because it felt scary and vulnerable. And I didn't, I hadn't done it before, but I was committed to not doing what everyone else sort of told me to do. I met with many agents who told me to do something very different. And I met with publishers who told me to do something very different. And when the pros tell you what you're doing is dumb, <laughs> you, 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 you know, rightly sort of second guess yourself. But I, I, was, I couldn't find another investment or money book that tried to bury the boring inside of a personal narrative. And I was just committed to doing that. <laughs> bury the boring. That's funny. Good little subtitle there. (laughs) Just one thing on your daughter, Harper, just because I love her so much. She is like so amazing and I just have to get that out there. So whatever you are doing as a parent, I have to like bottle up and copy. Not that I don't love my own kids, but you know, my kids love your daughter and she's just so awesome. So anyway, just have to say that. So you wrote really beautifully and openly about your battle with leukemia in this book and the whole lead up to it, the diagnosis, not knowing what was going on with you, the treatment, and you shared all the things you learned and especially Especially what you learned from the way the doctors actually handled your treatment has now informed your approach to professional services. So I was hoping you could talk a little more about how that experience has informed not just your personal life and sort of priorities living in the moment and all that, but also your professional life, mm. which could really be the rest of this podcast. So go ahead. <laughs> well, so much to unpack here. First, I would just say, When I was working on this section, I remember being teary-eyed in my office because it was, I feel so incredibly grateful. You know, for anyone who's listening, if you've ever sort of wondered, like, is something wrong with me or why am I feeling this way? I had been feeling like something was not right for some time. I had lost a lot of weight. I was having problem with my vision. I was sick all the time. And so the uncertainty of not knowing what's, what's wrong with me was creating a massive amount of anxiety. And I was only 32 years old. And so I had just left a job that I loved to start my own business with a, another partner. And I, I didn't handle the stress of that very well in hindsight. And I remember as I was recounting this story and trying to capture it and document it, 
I just had this overwhelming feeling of gratitude. And I went through a phase where I wrote thank you notes to anybody who was involved in either the research that helped me or the practitioners who helped me. But as to the specific question about how the doctors who helped me change me and change the way I work, it comes down to, and this may sound a little bit corny, but it's how I really feel. And a psychotherapist friend of mine said this expression to me. I was describing how when my eye doctor helped me figure out what was wrong, she opened her door and said to her assistant, cancel the rest of my appointments. And she shut the door. And I remember instantly not feeling as scared. And the reason I didn't feel as scared is because I felt well held. And that expression of like, someone's got you, you know, it's, it's going to be okay. The uncertainty and the feeling of like sort of floundering around in this uncertain, scary place was over. This person has you. And I felt that both when my eye doctor helped me figure it out and when my oncologist helped me walk down the path to a healthier future. And so I had never really felt that uncertain or scared before. And I had certainly never felt that well held or cared for before by a professional person or someone outside of my family. So it sounds so weird to say this, but I felt lighter. I felt like liberated when that happened. I was still scared, of course, but confident that these people were my advocates. They were with me. And yes, they understood the science behind what was wrong with me but they didn't want to burden me with all the unnecessary details or teach me everything they knew. They wanted to sort of hold my hand and help me. And that, that has informed so much of then my, my life post that experience. And honestly, Zibi, I really struggled with whether to include this section in the book or not, because I thought there are going to be people who who can't relate or they don't like this section or it feels feels too vulnerable or too scary for me. But I'm so glad I did. And I know this is cliche to say, but there is strength and power in the vulnerable. And so many people who have either had their own, you know, sort of health experiences or traumatic life events have then come to me after reading the book. And they don't want to talk about investment philosophy. They want to talk about how they had a similar experience or how they felt that same sort of feeling of being well held by someone else in their lives. And it was, so I'm really glad I put it in there, but it was tough to write and tough to sort of process, even though there is some important inspiration for me in it. Well, it was, I mean, I hate to say the worst part of your life was the best part of your book, but mm-hmm. <laughs> but I think it was that approach and the openness and just your willingness to share the whole thing. And you almost have this lighthearted tone that you take with all of the book, which is, you know, hey, I'm going to tell you a story and this is what happened to me and, you know, here's what I learned. And I don't know, I thought it was fantastic. So thank oh, you well, for thank sharing you. it. And you actually kind of tie that in. Your doctor at the time had told you, take this medicine, this is what you do, now go live your life. Yep. And you and you took that advice and just went off and did it. And then at the end of the book, you wrote, you're having like a moment of self-reflection. You say, when I roll into my driveway, I sometimes take a moment to sit with my feelings about all of this. We live in a complicated world. We don't know what will happen to any of us, even in the short run. Everything is uncertain, but we're not helpless. I remind myself to stay focused on what I can control and accepting of what I can't. Then I get out of the car, cross the yard, and I go inside and get on with my life. Oh, I get, like, I literally get goosebumps, like, reading that again. It was such a beautiful ending, not to give the ending away, but, you know, I'm not really giving anything away. But talk to me about even writing this. Were you, like, sitting there crying, writing this ending? Like, you just tied it all together so well, and it's, like, the doctor's advice and surviving this and then starting this whole business that you've done and all of it. And now you're, like, there you are, just living. Yeah. (laughs) So going back to the part about how my doctor really, I you know, the, the internet... If you have a health issue, the internet can be a dangerous place to explore what could be wrong with you. And I remember as I was getting the treatment, I went back through all these chat rooms and support groups and all these places where people were talking about the kind of leukemia I thought I had. And I came to the first appointment. I had all these questions and I handed the sheet to my doctor and he looked at it and he had a very nice look on his face. It didn't look sort of condescending or dismissive, but he looked at me and he said, Matt, I can answer these questions, but you're going to take 400 milligrams and you're going to get on with your life. And again, 
uh, well, a part of me was like, ah, I kind of would like the question. <laughs> <laughs> but again, it felt like liberating to have someone say, I have already filtered all of this for you. I know what matters. These are the things that matter. We'll get to some of this, but right now do these two things. And so as I wrapped up the book and as I, as I was thinking about how can I sort of mark and have a ritual of sorts of like remembering what matters, what's important, what to be grateful for. I mean, in the way that this connects to my business life is I think if you use the academic research and what science says about successful investing, you can be liberated from so asking questions that are all pretty noisy. They don't really mean much. They're not the sort of the essence. And I didn't, I, it doesn't mean that like when people ask us questions that we always say, you know, we're not going to answer them. It just means we want to help people. Part, we're also busy. Part of what you're doing is helping pe people filter for what the ideal book is to read, what's worth their time. And I think as we're all sort of cluttered with information and craving at some level simplicity, I think that's part of the beauty of what I was trying to get at at the end is you can still do very well and make smart investment decisions and actually outperform and be freed up to grab more of your time back. My doctor was saying to me, you can stop thinking about these worrisome questions, do what is essential and then live your life. And so I didn't want to, even when I, you know, the, the risk is when you get healthy is that you sort of forget how valuable the second chance is. Mm -hmm. Like there, to me, I have said this to a lot of friends, there's something really beautiful in a near miss, you know, for me, this was a rough experiment, but it was a near miss. Like I'm okay. And I don't want to lose that gratitude or appreciation. And, you know, you hyper focus after something traumatic happens on the finite amount of your time. You get really intentional about time, almost restless in the beginning. And I had to f try to figure out a way to live with ease, but also remember and be grateful that all of what I'm doing is important and I can be intentional about how I use time. So the ending of the book was really for me about saying, I have to daily remind myself of how fortunate I am. And that's what, that's what that part was about. Aww. And I think the quote in the book that you said about this whole thing is, sometimes you can help people make better decisions by not answering their questions. Mm -hmm. I feel like I try that with my kids sometimes. Like, I'm not going to answer these 67,000 questions about the day, but here we go. Here's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> It's yep. the same general approach. Well, speaking of time and the you know finite amount of time we all have, how did you fit in writing this book with the rest of your life and running your business and your family and tennis and all the rest of the stuff you love to do? Well, so people, as I mentioned to you, I had read all these investment books and I was like kind of telling friends occasionally, I think I might write my own book. And people people would instantly said, yeah, you ought to do that. I think you could, you could put something good together. And I had met with several other authors and said, I'm thinking about writing a book. What's your process? Who's your agent? How do you do it? And I was kind of tinkering around. I have a good friend who we were at breakfast one time and he was like, no one's going to do what you want to do, Matt. You have to do it. So either do it or stop talking about it. And I've always responded really well to either being underestimated <laughs> or being challenged or pushed. And that was sort of the gentle nudge I needed to get going. So I got really serious about time blocking and created sacred times where you just could not get to me unless someone was dying or in trouble or the house was burning down. So I had three hour chunks on generally Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. And I did, my whole process was different from what the advice I was given from some people. They said, you know, write a book proposal, get an agent, so on and so forth. Every agent I talked to told me to write a prescriptive, the sort of book that winds up in the nonfiction business book ghetto. I mean, I, I see all these books, I've read them all and I don't want to read them. I don't like them. And I don't think many humans wanted to read them. So I just wanted to do something different, but it took me 18 months to put this together even with that sort of dedicated time. And then I hired a great editing team who really helped me, I think, take what I was trying to do to the next level. Like one of the compliments I often get is that it's people read it in one or two sittings. That's what I said to you. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, I couldn't and, put and, it down. 
And I have to admit that one of the things that I wasn't capable of doing that I really needed help with was creating these hooks at the end of each chapter to allow people to keep going. I wanted this to be understandable and relatable and palatable for for, pe- for real people, not practitioners in my industry, which is who typically reads most of the technical books, the people who work in my space or want to work in my space, but not the real humans. So yeah, my process, I felt like it was really hard because I had never done it before. And I felt a lot of uncertainty because I didn't know if anyone was going to care about this. By the way, for me, it's been transformational. It's, I mean, from, from North Dakota to the Netherlands, I've talked to people all over the world. And I still to this day get emails or nice notes from people who have read the book and it's really been transformational for me. So in terms of aspiring authors, I would, you know, I'm biased because I'm on the other side of a lot of the struggle, but it's been without question, one of the best decisions I ever made, but it was a long, slow, like so many good things that are worthwhile. It was slow. It was hard, but very rewarding. And so I have enjoyed it. And now I feel like because I did the process, I should write another book yes. at some point. So we'll see when that comes about. But yeah, my process my process was lonely at times, fun at others. And at the end, I, was, I had a friend of mine who said, are you proud of what you did? I said, yes. And they said, then it doesn't matter what anyone else's reaction is to it. If, if you feel good about it, that's what matters. And I feel very proud of it. And it's still, you know, I worked on it five years ago. It came out three years ago and it's still creating great conversations to this day. That's amazing. I love that. Tell me a little more about Take the Long View, your podcast. And by okay. the way, you have like the best podcasting voice ever. I'm like, oh. you're there. I'm looking at you on Skype with like your whole setup and your microphone and like your voice is like, I could just like hang out and listen to your voice all day. So oh, anyway, good thing you. you have a podcast. <laughs> thank you. Well, you know, Zibi, my mission is sort of like, how can I change the way people think and feel about investing? And I was like, well, the book has been good, but the book is a commitment. You know, I like, I did my own audio book and it took three and a half, it's, it takes three and a half hours, I think, to listen to it. But it took me about 10 hours to tape that thing because <laughs> I had never done that before. So the podcast for me has been a way to make the same sort of message easier for people to grab onto. So they're doing the dishes They're You know this from your experience with this. It's like, I'm in the car, I'm doing, you know, meal prep, I'm doing some dishes, I'm exercising. It's so easy to grab hold of a conversation between two people. And again, how can I bury the boring or disguise the vegetables into other conversations. Part of why my firm's mantras take the long view is for the, in order for the sort of math to play itself out, you have to wait, you have to be patient. And I hate this analogy, but it works in some ways. If you think about it, a casino, the math is figured out. Everything else is a distraction to prey on human weakness. But the math is figured out. The winner is the owner of the casino. <laughs> and so in, so in many ways, I think the math is figured out, but it's, it's not as exciting for people. So I want to put some of the contrarian thinking inside of interesting stories and conversations. And I love doing the podcast, just like what we're doing today. It's so fun to have a conversation with, between two people and the listeners can eavesdrop in on that conversation. So I really enjoy it. It's been fun and it, it's a, afforded me an opportunity to sort of make the message and my mission even more attainable. So do you have any parting advice? I know you've already sprinkled this throughout our conversation, but any parting advice to aspiring authors? I say do it. Work on it in a way that I think that advice I mentioned earlier where it's like, if you're proud of it, if it means something to you, it's hard sometimes not to listen to the other voices, as I said about listening to professionals or people who had done it before. I didn't have one person who is saying, the way you want to do this is going to be great. (laughs) Everyone who was a professional kept saying, the way you want to do this won't work. People want prescriptions. They want you to tell them, buy this fund, do this magic trick, take this kind of approach with taxes and this kind of approach with estate planning, and everything will work out for you. And I couldn't imagine doing that for complete strangers when I know nothing about them. You can't sort of diagnose them when you don't know people. And I didn't want to dispense this sort of generic advice that, again, I could find in other books. So to me, it was like, I did an audit of how many people have written a memoir in the investing space that's been well-received or that's just out there. And I could only find two examples. And so I thought, 
you know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it my way. And so I would say, listen to that voice. You know, at some level what you want to accomplish and do the thing that is unique. That's been, you know, super helpful for me. Another interesting thing I would say, I got advice from an author and marketing guru named Ryan Holiday, who helped me think about how to get endorsements for the book. And I found the endorsements to be hugely valuable. I don't think endorsements sell books, but I think who people see on there, if they trust them, it can be a tipping point for actually the person picking up the book and taking it home and diving into it. If they don't, I'm not famous. I don't have a huge following. So if people see someone they know or recognize and trust, boom, even if it's from an, an unrelated field, it can be hugely helpful. So that advice from Ryan Holiday told me, don't just get a bunch of boring old white guys from the investment world, go get some other folks from other industries. And that was great advice. Excellent. That is great advice. And I don't think anyone said that before. So thank you. Sure, sure. <laughs> well, Matt, thank you so much for coming on my podcast and for writing this beautiful book. And I'm glad that you didn't listen to anyone because what's come out of it is a really special story and you're a great storyteller. So I'm really glad I got to read it and understand more about investing in a different way and certainly learn more about your life. So thank you for letting me in and sharing all that. Oh, Zibi, I'm honored by all your nice comments and honored to be on this great podcast and keep doing what you're doing by introducing people to the books and stories that are worth their time, especially moms who don't have time to read books. <laughs> I will. I'll try. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you, Zibby. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks again to my sponsor, Lauren Gabrielson, the women's wear brand that creates elevated essentials for the modern women's wardrobe, laurengabrielson.com. Thanks for listening to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. You can follow me on Instagram at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. Thanks for listening. You could always email me at zibby at zibbyowens.com. 